Hey everybody, it's Lon Seibin and it's time once again for your weekly wrap up. It's Monday yet again. I can't believe how fast these weeks go by. Uh, so we're going to talk about having more of me on Facebook. It's a follow up to a complaint I had last week. I'm going to offer my thoughts on the new Switch online service. We're going to talk about the new Amazon DVR box. Classic console wars are back. And we'll also look at getting one of those mini consoles versus a do-it-yourself situation. Uh, we're also going to look at some weekly wrap-up stats, and uh, I'll offer some thoughts, too, on mini-PCs and why I think they should have broader market penetration than they're currently getting. So lots to talk about, so let's get to it. And I want to begin by thanking our newest supporter here on the channel, Paul Bilodeau. He contributed via Patreon, and I want to thank Paul and everyone who's been contributing to the channel on an ongoing basis, along with everyone who watches the channel on a regular basis, too, because all of those things equal channel growth. Now, we don't have an advertiser this week, but we do have a non-ad, an affiliate link for something that I love, which is Audible.com. I've been an Audible member now for probably about six or seven years. It costs about $14.99 a month, but you get a free book every month, and typically the books you get will cost more if you were to buy them uh, versus what the monthly fee is. It's a pretty good deal. And they're sweetening the deal now, too, because they have Audible Originals, which are audio books that are only on Audible, and you get two of those now a month on top of your free book. And one of the ones I just picked up was this X-Files short story. It's about four hours long or so, but it's read by the cast, including David Duchovny and Gillian Anderson. So it kind of plays out like a radio play. And a lot of these books, especially the science fiction books, do play out that way. A lot of the Star Wars books have sound effects and different character voices. Uh, really good stuff, and there is just a ton, a ton of content available to you on Audible. Definitely worth checking out. Another cool feature that I've been using quite a bit is their Whisper Sync feature. So given that uh, Audible is an Amazon company, if you bought a Kindle version of a book and then get the audio version of the book, the two will remain in sync with each other. So if I am uh, reading the book on my iPad or my Kindle device, I put it down and then pick up my iPhone to start listening to the book, it will start reading it right where I left off, which is great. So you have the ability really to keep uh, both your printed copy and your audio copy in sync. And I've noticed now they're offering discounts on the Audible versions of books if you buy the Kindle book. I think they may have done this for a while, but I just noticed it the other day. So I picked up this book by Peter F. Hamilton, one of my favorite science fiction authors, and I also was able to get the audio book for $7.49, quite a, a lower price versus the regular audio book costs. So good stuff. Definitely check it out if you are interested in Audible. If you go to that link, I think you get a month for free to download a book and see if it is for you. Great stuff. Check it out. So let's take a look now at the week in review. And on the Extras channel, we've got an unboxing of the Lenovo Y730 gaming laptop we looked at last week, along with the Razer Huntsman Elite gaming keyboard that I hope to get to this week. So you can check out those unboxings over there. On the main channel, we looked at my trip to New York City last week. I went out to Pepcom, uh, which I've talked about in the past. These are like little trade shows, kind of like a mini CES uh, that they do in New York about once a quarter. Uh, the next one will be in Las Vegas at CES, which will be a much larger show. I'll talk a little bit more about my CES plans next week. I wanted to get some feedback from you on that, but we'll talk about it next week. We still have some time to think about it. Uh, we've got that review of the Lenovo Y730 gaming laptop. A bunch of folks asked about Linux. We did try to get Linux on it after I shot the review, but it did not work. It was locking up quite a bit. Uh, definitely some driver issues there that uh, are not yet resolved, so I'm not going to recommend it as a Linux device just yet, which is unfortunate. Uh, we also looked at the Shuttle XPC Nano, the NC03U. This is a line of mini PCs built on KB Lake. They start with the 3865U Celeron from KB Lake's generation of processors and work all their way up to an i7. Uh, we found the pricing on it right now for the i3 was pretty reasonable. So we're going to probably do one quick follow-up on the Celeron version just to see how well it runs the Dolphin emulator. Uh, that one might be up this week. We'll put that up on the Extras channel, but you can check out the full reviews of all this stuff at the Master Playlist link down below. 
And now it's time for a couple of things that are on my mind, and this is week 83 of me doing this as a full-time occupation. And you'll recall last week I was talking about Facebook and how they're uh, not really stepping up their game to be a competitor with YouTube, especially as it relates to smaller creators like myself. And wouldn't you know, uh, less than two hours after that video went up last Monday, I got this uh, little pop-up on my Facebook account telling me to step up my game and uh, join their Creator Launchpad program to monetize my videos. And wouldn't you know, they let me right in and everything is up and running. So I don't know if it was coincidental that that happened or if somebody there was watching it. So if you were, thank you. Uh, so you'll be seeing more of the things that I do on this channel over on my Facebook page at lon.tv slash Facebook. I plan to continue uploading the wrap-up videos from here where we're taking uh, portions of this video in uh, shorter form and putting them over there. Uh, we'll also have a lot of my other main content start to work its way over there too, along with the extras channel. We're gonna experiment a little bit with it to see what works best on that platform versus this one. Uh, because people, I think, consume media differently on Facebook than on YouTube, but we'll experiment and see where it comes and goes. And uh, you can, of course, follow me again on my Facebook page to see some of that content. I'm also going back to New York City on Thursday, just for the day, uh, for Tech Munch New York. Now, this is a food blogger uh, conference, but uh, it's something that I'm hoping to help some folks out in regards to video content and how to get yourself more noticed because really the things that I've learned doing what I do here are very applicable to uh, what you might do in any other vertical as well. So if you're in New York City and interested, uh, there are still tickets available, I believe, for the conference and you can sign up at the link that you see there going to be on a panel with a bunch of really cool people. So I'm really looking forward to meeting them and sharing some of my experiences as a video creator. And now it's time for some things in the news that caught my eye. And this week, of course, the Nintendo online service launched for the Switch. And I love my Nintendo Switch, as I tell you just about every week. And I like to travel with the Switch occasionally too, but I've been reluctant to do so uh, because I didn't want to lose all of the time I put into the games if my Switch got lost or stolen along the way. So now uh, the online service gives you the ability to back up your games to the cloud, uh, which I think alone is worth the $20 a year just to not lose that investment of time in some of these games. So I was pleased to uh, fork over my 20 bucks for that. I'm also happy with the Nintendo Entertainment System offering here because I know they'll be adding more games along the way. Uh, these are the launch titles that it has at the moment. And of course, I'd love to see more come to the system over time. What I hope they don't do is sunset games to add new ones in like Netflix does. It'd be nice just to see the library grow as time goes on. Uh, one surprise for me at least, because I wasn't following this all that closely, is that these NES games allow you to play online with your friends, which I thought was great. They even have like a drop-in, drop-out feature too with it. So that was really nice to see how they implemented that. But my gripe with it is that I can't play with random people. I would just love to start a session and just get matched up with somebody to play an NES game, but I can't do that. They have to be my friend. Uh, they also have to have their uh, version of the NES games on their Switch in that online mode as well. So there are some limitations to it. I hope they can make improvements to that. Uh, my other gripe with the NES system is that uh, you can't remap the controls. So I would have liked to have moved my button controls around a little bit. Can't do that just yet either. So hopefully they'll make some uh, tweaks to the online service as things go on here. But overall, I think for the money, it's not a bad deal. And uh, certainly the save data backups are really important to me and worth the price of admission. And if they add anything over the course of the next couple of months, uh, that will be a bonus as well. So all in, I'm pretty happy with it. And now there's another big piece of news this week, which is the Amazon Fire TV recast has been announced and it will be shipping next month. I did put in a pre-order for one, so we'll be getting one here to try out as best we can. As you all know, I don't get that much over the air here, but I should get enough channels that we can experiment with this device a little bit. And what this is, is a uh, Amazon Fire TV with a TV tuner and a hard drive installed in it. So you'll be able to watch live TV and record television and then play it back on your other Amazon Fire TV devices. So it looks like it's probably going to be locked into the Amazon ecosystem to a large degree, uh, which is understandable, I guess. And one of the things the box will be doing is transcoding the video on the fly uh, from the MPEG-2 video that you get over the air to uh, its native resolution and uh, the native codecs that a lot of their devices use. Because as we've discovered in the past here on the channel with the Amazon Fire TV Stick, 
is that it did not de-interlace video. So when we were watching some of the stuff on Plex, for example, we were seeing uh, little lines showing up on some of the 1080i content that was recorded by the box. And it looks like their way of getting around this issue is just to transcode it probably via hardware as the stuff is getting recorded. Uh, that led some folks on some message boards to speculate that perhaps this device uh, may actually uh, be a little slower in channel switching as a result because on the HD home run when you change the channel uh, it's pretty quick because it's just sending a native stream to your device. Here you're going to have some transcoding going on uh, but if it is hardware transcoding I think it probably will be pretty quick and we'll put that to the test when it's announced. So stay tuned we'll be looking at this very shortly. I think it costs about $200 and change for the two tuner version. Uh, there is also a quad tuner version coming out as well. So you could watch and, rec and or record two things at once on the entry level. Uh, the other one will be allowing you to do four things at once. We'll also look to see if this has any better performance than what we've seen on the Fire TVs lately. As, of course, the Fire TV 2, as we've discussed, is actually slower than the current iteration of Fire TV. So hopefully this one maybe has a little bit more performance built in. We'll be checking that out very shortly. And it looks like the console wars of the 90s are going to be reinvigorated with some new classic consoles from the big three. Uh, Sega has announced that they will be making a higher quality version of their Genesis Mini that was announced earlier this year. Uh, they had initially contracted with AT Games to put that together. AT Games makes those cheap plug and plays we see at uh, just about every discount store out there and you definitely get what you pay for with them. So it looks like they are bringing it back in house to make a better product. So that's going to be delayed, uh, but it is coming next year. Later this year, though, it looks like the PS1 Classic will be arriving at your mailbox if you were uh, quick enough to pre-order one. I did this time because I always miss the boat on these things. Uh, this will be a little miniature version of the Sony PlayStation 1 with some of the uh, classic games from that console. So that's going to be about 100 bucks and should be out very shortly. And we've long speculated that the next mini console from Nintendo will be the N64. And we don't have confirmation of that yet, but there looks to be a European a trademark filing that details the controller in a format that we've seen on the boxes of the other Nintendo consoles. And the fact that this news happened to just leak out the same week that the PS1 Classic uh, was announced, I think lends some credence to the fact that this holiday season you'll be able to get your hands on a little mini version of the Nintendo 64. I'm eager to see if they are doing this, what they're going to do to the controller. Uh, my understanding from how the original controller was designed was that the analog stick on it was overly complicated. Uh, so I'm sure they'll probably do some simplification of that or use more commodity parts for the analog stick on this new mini console if they do indeed make one. But I've been very pleased with the quality level that Nintendo put into these classic consoles. I have the SNES classic console in the back room over there, and it is really well built. The controllers feel right. Just is a really nice thing to have and play with, and uh, no doubt they'll put the same level of quality into that console. Sony definitely appears to be taking a page out of Nintendo's book, even down to the classic moniker uh, for what they're developing. So these are really nicely designed little pieces of history that I think a lot of consumers will be interested in, and I hope Sega now, uh, taking back their license from AT Games, will do the same with their Genesis Mini console. All in, it'll be a very good year. Uh, for us retro game fans looking for a bit of official uh, nostalgia to play on their televisions. And now it's time for a Q&A, and our first question relates to those mini consoles. And uh, this is not a viewer who tweeted this, but a viewer retweeted it, Epos Vox, but I wanted to talk about this a little bit. Uh, so Joseph W. talks about the PSX Classic, which is that little PS1 mini that we just talked about. And he says, you know what, you could go out and buy one used with a uh, mod chip and some CDRs and get the same experience for far less than $99. Or, of course, you can build your Raspberry Pi and uh, do it yourself. And that is very true, but I don't think consumers are looking to make any effort uh, to get this experience back. They really don't have time to do the things that we all do as hobbyists with this technology. And I think at the end of the day, consumers want appliances. And when Nintendo, or in this case Sony, comes out with an appliance that 
really makes them feel nostalgic for the original console, a really nice scale model of the device they used to have hooked up to their TVs and a full scale, uh, very functional controller that feels very similar to what they remembered as a kid. Uh, if you can go out and buy that for 100 bucks or $79 or whatever, uh, you're going to do that because you don't have time to make your own thing or solder in mod chips. And a great example of where consumers are going uh, can be found with virtual reality. It kills me, as I've talked about a lot, that VR hasn't taken off the way it should have, given how good it is right now and how bad it was just a few years ago. So if we take a look at VR sales worldwide from 2017 to 2018, you're going to see that the biggest selling VR system on the market by far in both years has been the PlayStation virtual reality system that plugs into the PlayStation 4. Everybody has the same experience. You buy the console, you buy the box, you plug it into the console and you're done and you've got VR and it's selling more than its competitors are combined or at least equal to uh, all of its other competitors. It's still not a huge market. It still has a lot of room to grow apparently, um, but it looks like consumers are not looking to make this a complicated transaction. They don't wanna to have to deal with graphics cards and PC configurations and getting all these pieces put together in the right way and spending all this money when they can just get something that plugs in. It won't be as good as the more expensive stuff is, but for most consumers, it's good enough. And that, again, uh, comes down to the point that consumers want appliances. Now, going back to some of these classic consoles, if I consult my focus group, which is my circle of family and friends, uh, I have a lot of people that just love these little mini classic consoles that come working out of the box. And for many years, I've been telling my friends, hey, you remember those games we used to play as a kid? I could put them on your phone for you. Wouldn't that be fun? They're like, yeah, yeah, maybe I'll get it going. You, know, you put them on there. They never play with it because it's so hard to get up and running. Yet a lot of them went out and bought these consoles and uh, were sharing videos and photos of their kids playing with the games they used to play with when they were their age. And I think there's something about these things that uh, consumers want more than something like one of these do-it-yourself kits that require a lot more effort to get up and running. If it's your hobby, great, but if it's not your hobby and you just want to play a game every once in a while, I think those uh, little classic consoles are going to be here to stay, and it's great to see manufacturers looking to fill the void for us who are really just looking for a quick way to enjoy those old games. As next question is more of a YouTube business question, which I always love to answer. Uh, Duncan Cunningham wrote in saying that a bunch of channels that he follows are now putting some of their weekly longer content on different channels versus their main channel to maybe prop up the viewership on some of their mainline content. So of course on this channel, most of the content that I do are product reviews and this is a weekly anomaly in that it's a very different type of content. Uh, but I figured, you know what, if other people are doing that, uh, maybe I should look into this. So the first thing I did, of course, was consult my statistics to see how I'm doing from one year to the next. So this is kind of a year to date comparison. Uh, this is January to uh, September 21st. And you can see here that my watch time is up pretty significantly uh, as well as my views. So we're not losing any viewership here even though I'm continuing to do the wrap up and it's getting longer and longer. Uh, in fact, once I started doing this full time, the wrap up got a lot longer, I think. So this has certainly been a newer uh, concept to the show here, at least longer form, uh, 30 plus minute uh, content once a week. So I'm not seeing any reduction in viewership overall. This is every video on my channel, by the way. Um, so I'm, I'm okay with uh, what I see here so far because we're seeing some growth. Uh, and then what I wanted to do was look at uh, the average view duration because a couple of things that YouTube looks at, of course, is not only uh, how many views and watch hours you're getting, uh, but also how long are people sticking around on your videos. And you can see here I'm doing a little bit better in 2018. We're running about uh, four minutes on the average of uh, viewer attention, and that is a, a good trend line I see here is that orange line is creeping up above the blue. Um, so that was good to see. People are spending more time watching what we do here, which was encouraging. Uh, and I also wanted to look at the last eight weekly wrap-up videos to see what the retention level is on those and check it out. So although my average uh, view retention is about four minutes, um, most of you spend at least 13 minutes watching these videos, which is great to see. And another encouraging statistic that came out of this evaluation is that 79% of the people who watch the wrap-up videos are subscribers, uh, which is the inverse of my normal review videos. Only about 
20% of the views I get on my reviews come from subscribers. So my mission with this, with this series is to reach out to subscribers, and it looks like we're accomplishing that, number one, and it also looks like we're accomplishing a much longer watch time versus my average, and maybe to some degree, this is actually driving up the overall watch time average of the channel, which actually probably does better uh, on YouTube search and algorithm recommendations because of it. So all those things combined here, I think I'm going to stay put uh, with the wrap up on this channel because I'd hate to have to get you all to move somewhere else to watch it when it's doing a lot of help of the channel here versus harm. So I am comfortable having looked at the data here to let the show stay put. Uh, we may at some point change the date of it. Uh, one of the things I experimented with this week was putting that Pepcom recap out on a Sunday morning just to see how it would do, and it actually did pretty well. So that informed me about maybe some things to think about uh, as we roll forward here on the wrap-up as to when it gets uploaded. But beyond that, uh, I think I'm going to keep the wrap-up right here because it seems to be helping the channel, so we'll be sticking with that. Now, one thing I did do, though, because I didn't want to overload subscribers, is create the extras channel. And this is kind of a place where I do really quick hit kind of things. Um, there's some products that are, you know, cool, but not cool enough to be something I push out to the main subscriber base, but I still want to get the benefit of search traffic. And that's what the Extras channel does. I unbox stuff. Um, so those are really quick and easy videos to do. And the best part is I have to unbox the stuff anyhow, so I may as well record it. Uh, and I'm looking at uh, the trends there, which have been very good. I'm starting to get a lot of search traffic on uh, that channel's activity, and it's also monetized because it met the minimum thresholds from YouTube. So I did that in a way to prevent having uh, this channel gunked up with shorter videos that may not have the same level of care and quality put into them as I do on this one. Uh, so if you are looking for more from me, definitely subscribe to the Extras channel at lon.tv extras. Now, I got a related question in just after that one. It's kind of funny how these things always come in in pairs from different people. Uh, and Baramoose was wondering about the overall watch time implications, especially when you have something like I have, which are the credit rolls that uh, run at the end that thank all of the Patreon subscribers. Now, when I started doing this, when I first started doing Patreon, it was a very short credit roll, uh, but now it's running at about a minute or so. It's pretty long, thanks to all of you who are contributing on an ongoing basis to the channel. So I dug into this a little bit, too, because there is an implication that if people are dropping off your, your maybe three-minute video at the two-minute mark when the credit roll starts, that certainly will hurt its search position a bit just because you're not getting the uh, full benefit of a long-watched video. Um, and what's funny, though, is I started looking at the data, is that people are watching the end credit rolls. It's dropping very quickly here, as you can see, but they're not dropping off almost universally. There's just a tail off here. So people are actually watching to the end in some cases, uh, but in many cases, they're not all dropping off the minute those credit rolls pop on. And I think the reason for that is that because most people who watch what I do are not subscribers, they're probably curious to see what this credit roll is all about and maybe stick around and uh, watch it for a few more seconds than they otherwise would. So as a result of that, I'm not seeing a universal you know, uh, canyon here. It's kind of a, a slope <laughs> down as uh, people tune out. So uh, it's something to think about, though, for some of the shorter videos on the Extras channel. But I did check out a few of those shorter videos, and some of those are doing just fine anyhow. So maybe something in the YouTube algorithm determines that if enough people are watching something about this product, they may as well put it up in front of more people. And some of the Extras channel videos now uh, have a lot of views, uh, even though they are very short and have a good chunk of that time made up by the end credit rolls. Now, this last question comes in from John in regards to mini PCs and what he's doing with his. He found uh, his mini PC to work great as a Plex server, given that it can do everything he needs it to do thanks to the transcoding that's built into the Intel chip, but it consumes a lot less power than what he was using before. So it was a real win-win for him. And he sees uh, these things working more as appliances, again, uh, than as a traditional computer. One of the things that I struggle with when I do a review of a mini PC is to try to anticipate all the different things that somebody may want to do with one because everyone comes in looking for something else. And what I like to look at is what might the consumer's perspective be, that if you see this 
$150 bare bones computer on Amazon, uh, what do you want to do with it? And I have to, again, anticipate what maybe a family might want to do with a very value-minded PC. Can they browse the web? Can they do word processing? Can the kids get their homework done on it? But I also have to think about the enthusiasts, about the home theater side of it, or maybe those who are looking for an emulation box. So those are why I look at all these different things, because people do actually buy uh, mini PCs for gaming sometimes, and that's partly one of the considerations. I do think that we're at a point now, especially with some of the Gemini Lake Nux that we looked at recently, uh, these mini PCs for a very low price might be enough for many families. You can even edit video within reason on them as well as we've tested out. A little slow, but it can uh, do basically anything you may want to do on a PC that would cost a lot more. And then if you get into things like these shuttle devices or the other Intel NUX running with i5s and i7 processors, uh, really the sky's the limit on this stuff. And it's surprising that uh, many of the mainstream manufacturers haven't really marketed these things more. I think it's partly because they probably are low margin devices, especially when you can buy you know, these cheap uh, PCs for $150. It's hard to make a lot of money off of something like that. And that might be why they haven't done much with them. But I think there's room in the marketplace for a manufacturer to come up with something that's all inclusive, almost appliance like running Windows uh, that could really, I think, capture a lot of market share if they have enough of a marketing budget to get them there. And I think that might be the real push and pull here is how do you get the marketing budget right with such a low margin item? Can you generate enough volume and educate enough consumers to uh, run in that direction? So I think there's potential there uh, if somebody were to come up with a really good out of the box experience with a uh, sub $200 mini PC. Now HP did have a sub $200 mini PC back in 2015. Uh, this was running with a Celeron processor, basically the same guts as their Chrome box at the time. Uh, so similar in line to what we now see with the KB Lake Celeron chips. It performed exceptionally well for the price point. It kind of looked like one of the plastic bowls my kids eat out of, but it was really a pretty decent computer. But I think they had a hard time finding a market for it uh, without eating into some of the other higher margin products they were selling to customers. So it didn't get reproduced as future processor generations came along. So we're still seeing mini PCs kind of relegated into this enthusiast specialty market. But I think there's a real chance here that, again, if somebody really spent some time and effort to market something to consumers as a good alternative, they could sell. It just is going to take a tremendous amount of investment, not so much on the hardware development, but on the marketing side uh, to get above all the other marketing out there from some of the major brands. And now it's time for a Q&A for you. I'm curious what you're using your mini PC for. I think we've asked this in the past, but it'd be nice to get an update from all of you as to what you're doing with it. Is it your home theater PC, your emulation box, or all of the above? Let me know down in the comments below. Now our channel of the week this week was something interesting that I stumbled across the other day, thanks to YouTube's recommendation engine, and it is called Game Hut. And this is by a guy who was a former Sega developer. He worked on the Genesis and I think on the Saturn as well. And what's kind of fun about this channel is just seeing some of the tricks that they used to do programmatically to get more out of these consoles. And he's got some really good visuals where uh, in one instance he was talking about a 3D Sonic game on the Saturn and how they used each of the chips. And they were taking uh, some of the footage of this development process and overlaying it on top of the chips so you can see how each of those chips work together to produce the final image of the game. Really very uh, easy to understand, easy to follow, and the videos are not all that long either. They really pack in a lot of information in a very concentrated way there. So check out Game Hut. Uh, great stuff. Another one of these hidden gem channels under 100,000 subscribers that uh, deserves more. So that was my channel of the week. So this week I've got a lot on the docket here. I'm not sure I can get to all of it due to some travel and some other stuff I'm working on. Uh, but we are going to talk about a new product from HP that came in. Uh, it's not going to be anything crazy, groundbreaking, exciting, but there is an embargo on it. But you will see it uh, Tuesday or Wednesday, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, we also might get into this later in the week, which is playing around with Steam OS again, uh, because they have now put in some ways to get Windows compatibility on that Linux operating system. I was hoping I could get that to boot up on that uh, Lenovo, but I couldn't get Ubuntu to work on it, nor could I get Steam OS working. So we're going to find some other piece of hardware uh, in the room here that will work with it. So be on the lookout for that. 
Uh, before that, though, we're going to uh, cover our, week, our monthly video that we do for Plex. I haven't yet figured out exactly what I'm going to do just yet, so if you had any things that you wanted me to cover with Plex, let me know down in the comments below as I put together the planning for that video. That'll be up a little later in the week. I also hope to get to my review of the Huntsman Optical Keyboard uh, that we got in the other day through the Amazon Vine program. You can see that unboxing on the Extras channel. There might be some other things that pop in or not uh, throughout the course of the week here. If you want to help the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv support and make a monthly or a one-time contribution to the channel. We also have our ongoing relationship with Plex, where if you sign up for a free Plex account, no credit card required, uh, we get a small commission. We get a slightly larger commission if you sign up for a Plex Pass or gift it to somebody else. We also have other channels, the Extras channel, which I talked about quite a bit already, the podcast where you can find this show in audio form. We also have some interviews coming up. In fact, this week, I think I'm going to be interviewing uh, somebody from a small ISP that is dropping fiber optic cable uh, throughout parts of Connecticut here. We'll talk about some of the challenges in competing with the big ISPs. That'll be a fun one, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, those usually post up on the podcast feed before they show up here on video. We have the Snippets channel where we take portions of this show and upload them in a more search-friendly format. And we have the archive of live streams, which you can find at lon.tv slash live streams. I will be doing another one soon once my schedule clears up a bit, so be on the lookout for that probably sometime into October. And as the winter comes around, when I've got more time, uh, you'll probably be seeing more uh, live streams from me as well. Now, I do ask if you want to follow what I do to click on the bell so you get notified across all my channels whenever we upload or go live or do anything else. Uh, so that's a great thing to do. You can also engage with the channel on my email list at lon.tv slash email. We have the newly revived Facebook page with more video at lon.tv slash Facebook. So you'll see portions of this show kind of just dropped into your Facebook feed throughout the week, along with some unboxings and some other content as we experiment on that platform. We also have the Facebook group, which is growing by leaps and bounds. It's been a great place for viewers to interact with each other. Uh, so you can check that out at lon.tv slash Facebook group. And I do pop in there quite a bit throughout the week as well. So if you're looking to start a conversation and have some technical support questions, for example, that's a great place to go because if I can't get an answer quickly to you, other people in there have been very helpful uh, with other fans of the channel to get them up and running. So it's been a great community and I am really excited about how that's been turning out. And we have my store at lon.tv slash store. And right now there's nothing in the store. There will be some more soon. I just haven't had time to collect another batch of stuff to get rid of. So there will be more to come. Uh, and when that stuff does get put in there, uh, you can sign up for an email alert so that when things update, you can get notified immediately. Sometimes there's a big rush on stuff when it goes up for sale. So uh, click on that link there, sign up for that email alert. And every time I do update the store, I push out an update to everyone on that list. So that is going to do it for this week on the wrap up. Thank you all for watching far longer than my average watch time is here. Let me know if you made it all the way to the end in the comments below. And until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Chris Allegretta, the Four Guys with Quarters podcast, Tom Albrecht, Gerard Newberg, and Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.